Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Tuesday and welcome to another Barometer webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager here at Barometer. This afternoon, we will provide you with a brief mar market overview, um, followed by your questions and our answers. So please don't be shy. Feel free to hit me up on the chat via Zoom or email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. It's uh, mid-September. David, happy afternoon. Happy Tuesday, Pam. Yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> Nice to see you as well. Lots going on in the market after um, we've uh, come out of the summertime. So looking forward to hearing your views on um, how we're positioned. And uh, with that, I turn the conversation over to you, David. Great. Thanks, Pam. Um, so obviously, uh, we're into the middle of September. It's always a period of time when people get nervous about uh, late September and October. So we're going to take a look through some of the lenses that we use to make decisions uh, and look at sort of the underlying health of the market. If I were to say something uh, just from a very high level, one of the things that Diana, our trader, and I always talk about is it's not so much the news that's important. It's how the market reacts to news that is more important. Uh, and there have been lots of important tells over the last little while. It's something that we watch very closely. There's always news. There's always things to think about. There's always things to worry about. Uh, we spend more time trying to understand how well the market is absorbing news. And we have, over the last number of weeks and months, had pretty good shock absorbers in place. Uh, market breadth readings, from our standpoint, have been pretty good. <clears throat> but of course, you know, this is the time of year when we always get tested a little bit. Uh, we have lots of nervous folks out there. Uh, over the last, uh, let's say, six or eight weeks, many institutions have been a little bit more cautious. Uh, over the last two weeks, a number of the large investment banks have become a little more cautious, a lot of them citing the time of the year. Um, but interestingly, you know, the market's been quite resilient. So let's just start with a really high level view, you know, baseline to, to begin with, as, as we always have always do. Our belief is we are in a structural bull market in equities that started in the U.S. in 2013 uh, and has spread around the world over time as markets have taken out the highs from the previous bull market. Uh, and in general, you know, things continue to be quite constructive. Uh, on the rates front, we think we've been going through a bottoming process in yields and, uh, and that sort of continues. Uh, and the reason that we care about that is that what works in rising rates or a reflationary environment is quite different than what works in falling rates. And you can see that, you know, in, in the past, when you've gone through a directional shift in rates, it often takes several years to take place and it happens in fits and starts at the beginning. And so we do watch that quite quickly, <clears throat> quite, quite closely. And then the third thing that we've talked about is the fact that we think we've been going through uh, a reversal in long-term trend in the commodity markets. Uh, which have an impact specifically on Canada and some other global markets and some smaller parts of the market that could become more important, given the fact that after many years of underperformance, you know, they're not well owned uh, and, uh, and certainly value is there. So <clears throat> this is a chart I've had put in front of me, and this is September and October. Uh, if we went back and averaged things out since 1950, and so we are in a period that tends to be more choppy uh, and we watch, watch it closely. Um, but there's a difference between a market pulling back three, 4% and the market pulling back 15 or 20. Right? Very difficult to trade a market that pulls back three or 4%. It's perfectly natural. Uh, uh, not quite as difficult to protect against the bigger declines. And so one of the things that I've had pinned on my Twitter feed over the last three years is <clears throat> the most difficult thing to do in a bull market is to stay in your winning positions. Uh, the most difficult thing to do in a bear market is to be a good seller. So in a good market, there's always going to be folks that talk about the reasons why we should have a pullback. Uh, frankly, if we'd been spending a lot of time listening to those points, we've been shaken out of our positions many times over the last year. When we look at the S&P 500, we've had a bunch of pullbacks, I think nine pullbacks to the 50-day moving average over the course of this rally. 
And here we are, you know, sort of approaching the 50 day again. This is the last sort of two weeks. Uh, and first of all, the S&P 500, um, that's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 10 trading days, two weeks. Uh, and here is the NASDAQ 100. In both cases, we're right within the ranges that we've been in for quite some time uh, and, and continue to be. Now, the indexes don't tell all the story. There's lots of things that happen underneath the surface that we have to keep an eye on because we don't want to own all of the market. We want to own the productive parts. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But if you boil down what we're trying to get accomplished, there's three basic things. You know, we're trying to use the tools that we have to identify the most productive parts of the market. When you get into a bull market, there tends to be some consistent leadership from some groups that for whatever reason have a tailwind. It may be that those groups have been under-owned and become more owned over time as valuations improve. Uh, but we don't need to be in every sector, especially in a decent market where correlations are not high, where everything isn't acting the same. You can add a lot of value that way. We're always watching for a shift in market leadership because that can tell us a message about changing conditions and what we might be doing from a positioning standpoint in our portfolios. And then there is a condition where nothing's working, uh, in which case we need to be prepared to play some defense. Now, I put a, a, a piece up on Twitter this morning just talking about stop losses and why it is that we use stop losses as opposed to trying to pick highs in the market. And that is because in a bull market, if we had 20 positions we put on over the course of the year, uh, seven or eight aren't going to work. Um, a few are going to do reasonably well, and a small handful are going to give us a lion's share of the returns. So the most important thing in a bull market is to hold on to your winning positions and let them run. Don't try and pick highs. If something's changing for the better in a business or a sector, it generally can go on a lot longer than what you might expect. On the other hand, you can't let a little mistake turn into a big mistake. So by following along with stop losses, it allows us to stay in those winning positions, even though they may have short-term pullbacks. But if they aren't changing trend, then pullbacks are normal. So we're going to talk about things in that context today, but really what we're trying to do is, is provide a, a really tactical approach to investing because frankly, if what you want is passive investments, you can go out and buy the index and get that for free. So from a breadth perspective uh, this week, more or less the same as last week, U.S. breadth models continue to be positive. In other words, while you saw in the index that we've seen little pullbacks over the last two weeks, very few stocks have broken their long-term upward price trend. So it's one thing to pull back within trend. It's quite another to break trend, which means you now have a greater chance of losing money if you've now moved into a downtrend. So that's something that we watch very closely. There's no bear market in history that ever took place while breadth or the percentage of stocks in uptrends was expanding. That's a healthy market. So what we can say is that in the US, breadth continues to be healthy. And that takes into account the NASDAQ, the Amex, the NYSE, and so on, a broad base, not just a few large companies within an index. Global bullish percent or global breadth for equities also continues to be quite healthy. Now, a couple of the short-term indicators, percent of stocks trading with positive weekly price momentum has bounced around a little bit over the last few weeks. Uh, and the percent of stocks about their 150 day moving average has bounced around a little bit up and down over the last few weeks. <clears throat> but nothing really significant that we can point to that points to a change in the nature of the market. When we look at the way people feel, what you might expect has been happening as we've seen consolidation in some groups, bullishness or excess optimism has come down. That's a healthy thing. When we go around the world and we look at the major regions, all Latin America is green, meaning breadth is expanding. Uh, breadth in Asia Pacific is expanding. Breadth in Europe is expanding. Breadth in the US is expanding. So most countries and regions around the world are showing improving breadth. That's a healthy thing. We watch it frequently, but we also 
watch the level, roughly 50% of stocks global year in uptrends. One of the things that we know is when you get late in a bull market, you get might hit to a point where 70 or 80% of stocks are all headed higher at the same time. You know, that's something that we watch for, for over optimism. But right now at 50%, things are quite reasonably priced. When we look at credit spreads, or the amount of excess return that a corporate bond buyer is demanding relative to what they would get in a government bond, you can see that at the height of the pandemic panic, they were asking for a lot of excess return, right? In the, in the um, core investment grade bonds, they were asking for close to 3.4% three, uh, above a similar maturity government bond. Today, we're at about 1% and near historic lows, meaning that bond investors are not concerned that their corporations that they're funding with debt are going to forfeit or default. So credit default swaps are quite narrow. Let's look at some of the weekly data. We've spent a lot of time talking about COVID. We've spent a lot of time talking about employment, what the Fed is thinking. There are a few key charts that we're keying on. So one of the things the Fed has said is that they are quite comfortable having an accommodative stance until employment gets back toward trend. So here's where we were with 152 million jobs in uh, February of last year. It's sitting at 147 million today. We certainly are making up ground, but nowhere near back to trend. That gives the Fed license to continue to be accommodative. When we look at the jobless claims, they are slowly coming down, that's positive. But it hasn't been, there haven't been tons of new jobs created over the last uh, month or so. One of the things that we think it really stands out to us is the JOLTS data. That's the US job openings by industry total. And what we know is that there are just about uh, 10.1 million jobs currently available in the US that are unfilled. And when we look back over the last number of years, this is the biggest gap between job openings and qualified people applying for jobs. So there is no shortage of jobs, but we still have employment data that is well off the highs and that isn't gonna close anytime soon. One of the other things that we're getting asked about is inflation. When they surveyed the National Federation of Independent Businesses about their single biggest concern, they report that it is concern around inflation. And obviously that's been a significant spike. We've seen all kinds of numbers that show inflation in the data. And there are, is one camp that would say this is something that will be persistent. There's another camp that would say this is supply chain issues and that it's transitory. So we got some CPI data this morning and CPI data annualized came down just a smidge from 5.4 to 5.25. And it came down uh, in part because of some areas that get calculated into CPI. So this is CPI, or consumer inflation, where we take out <clears throat> food and energy and listen, food and energy are a part of life, but when we look at, at CPI, X food and energy, actually it came down a little bit more, 4% off a high of 4.5. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at the month over month, it tells a little bit different story that really the month over month data is starting to become more benign. Now, there's reasons why CPI came in below the 3% expected sorry, the, the 10, 1% uh, expected. Uh, let's take a look at it, sorry, 0.1. Few things seem to be normalizing. Prices for used cars and trucks came in down and we know that they were up sharply in June. Lodging away from home for travel, again, up sharply in June and July, down 2.9% for the month of August. Car and truck rental prices came down quite sharply public transport came down quite sharply. If we looked at uh, uh, price of airline tickets, they came down fairly significantly. And they made up a, a, the, the majority of the lower CPI data that came in. So people were quite concerned about a hot number today. It was not the case. Number came in slightly below. 
So let's talk about some of the leadership themes. And basically, like in the indices, we saw some consolidation over the course of the week. So the IYW, which is the iShares US Technology ETF, over the last seven or eight days has pulled back a little bit from about 108 to 10660. You know, that's about 1%, nothing to be too concerned about. We've had lots of little pullbacks along the way. Mm -hmm. What I think is relevant is the most economically sensitive and the most important indicator for demand, the semiconductor index made even today a new all time high. So we know semiconductors are in short supply, but we also know it's a basic building block that goes into everything and orders can disappear quickly. There is no sign that there's any kind of dissipation in the demand for semiconductors. And that is a positive tell for the economy and for the market. Within it, the leading stocks continue to do well. And if we look at a semiconductor index equally weighted, meaning each component of that index weighted the same, you can see that semiconductors relative to the S&P 500 have been seeing rising relative price strength and actually made a five month high relative to the S&P 500. You would expect if the real concern was that economic growth was not resuming for this to start to fail relative to the S&P, no sign of that at this point, but that's one data point. NVIDIA, one of our key holdings, certainly has consolidated over the last two weeks in, a, in about a $10 range or a four or 5% range, very, very healthy. Let's see it happen many times over the last couple of years. Uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, same thing, consolidating over the last week. Cybersecurity, consolidating and pulling back to the 21 day moving average. So technology in general, consolidating. And that's something that we watch because that's been leadership in the market. One company that has an, is an important one, obviously Apple has pulled back a little off the highs, seven, eight percent. Uh, and that's pulled back leading into the event today. Perhaps the event was a little bit underwhelming, pulled back a little bit, but again, we're just pulling back to the 50 day moving average, but that's something certainly we'll watch. When I look at a point and figure chart of Apple, which plots upward and downward movement, and we like to see on a point and figure chart, sorry, when it's moving higher, we mark it out in X's, lower moving, marking it out in zeros. So since March, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, and consistently higher highs. So if the stock pulls back to $142, no concern, it's $148 here. The first sign of any trouble would be at $140, which is you know $8 below where we are now. You know This pullback so far completely normal. The reason I put it up is it is completely representative of what we're seeing across all kinds of groups and all kinds of important stocks. Things pulling back a little bit within trend, but not breaking down, not changing the relative breadth readings in the market. When we look at commodities, another core area that we've been focused on, this is the RJI or the Rogers Commodities Index. It's an equally weighted basket of commodity prices. If, if the economy was rolling over, then you would expect that commodity prices broad-based would start to back off with demand. But again, here we are trading virtually at the highs for a broad basket of commodities. Now that includes metals, includes agriculture, includes a bunch of groups. We talked about uranium over the last couple of weeks. Look at the move that the, the uranium ETF has had coming out of that consolidation over the last three weeks. Just been a giant move. It's moved from $19 to $28 as of yesterday. Pull back a little bit today, <clears throat> but that's the type of thing that can happen after a group consolidates. Natural gas also very, very strong. And for this time of year, September, natural gas to be having this kind of move does pose the question, what might happen when we get to winter? Now, at $5 per MCF in North America, that is way below the world price. In Europe, they pay $20 or more, about four times higher. Uh, so we watched this group, and in our energy exposure, we really have been more focused on gas producers than oil producers. Uh, there's the price of oil moving higher after pulling back <clears throat> through July and August, moving higher into the fall, and made a new high this morning. Uh, lithium has consolidated over the last couple of weeks, but trading around the highs. This is materials going into batteries, of course, in demand for electric vehicles. This is agricultural commodities, and after having broken out of its consolidation, sort of moving a little bit higher last week, pulling back a couple of percent 
but again, into the moving averages. So commodities continuing to look quite attractive. <clears throat> financials. Now, financials are a reflationary sector. They are tied to the economy. We broke out of this consolidation a few weeks ago. We've made a couple of higher lows since then. We're sitting right on the 50-day moving average. We think that the most important group to follow are the brokers and dealers and asset managers. It's the IAI ETF. And because they're the most market-driven uh, and the most variable business model uh, based on market conditions. And again, we've just seen a series of higher lows and higher highs, some consolidation, very healthy uh, and holding well above rising 50-day, 150-day and 200-day moving averages. So should we break the 50-day moving average? Maybe it could pull back to the 150-day moving average, but that's a would have, should have, could have. We'll wait and see what happens at this point, you know, certainly continuing to look quite healthy. We look at the industrials. The industrials broke out of this range. We pulled back to 150-day moving average and where we broke out, we'll see if we hold from here. My expectation is it is likely that we will. When we look at the global markets, also an, uh, an indicator for global appetite for risk, India's market has been very strong sideways over the past week. Uh, Japan, after nice consolidation, has been moving smartly higher over the last couple of weeks. So as you can see, the global markets, as we saw in the breadth indicator in general, acting well, uh, this is Mexico, slow, slow grind higher, big trading partner with the US. So look, <clears throat> if we look at the MTUM ETF, we consolidated from March, until July, where we broke out. Since then, we've made two higher lows and continues to look quite attractive. So if we are into the meat of the most difficult part of the year, and if we are concerned about Delta and concerned about inflation and concerned about employment and concerned about you know, how well-owned the market is, market's pretty resilient. It's hanging in, it's absorbing news. So. Diana calls this the Teflon market. Virtually anything that has come to hit the market has rolled off. So we watch for signs of changes every day, but the net of it is we have to be positioned in the things that are constructive so that as the rally resumes, we are positioned. The positioning really hasn't changed much. Our financials weights come down a very small amount, but we're way overweight relative to market. Technology, we're a little underweight versus market, but we have a good size position. Industrials, real estate, communication services, communications, uh, consumer staples. You'll see our holdings are a little broader based than we were earlier in the year because we'd like to see some of this leadership reaccelerate. But at this point, it makes sense for us to be invested. Look, there are always things to worry about and we always look for where the risks could come from. But at this point, the way that the market is digesting news continues to be very constructive. Things that we watch closely, yes, there have been very significant flows into the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100, the technology, largely the technology-driven sector where the behemoths are. This is something that we watch. And this is why we don't have a market weight in technology, because we do think that maybe if the economy starts to pick up, and rates start to pick up, the tech could underperform. We'll watch for signs of that, but at this point it continues to act well. The, the financial conditions continue to be very easy. There's lots of liquidity in the system. And as a result, it's floating a lot of different boats. So it's our view that it, we're a long way away from rate increases. It's possible by year end, we could see a tapering in the Fed's bond buying system, and that might reduce the new liquidity that they're putting into the market, but we'll do very little to tighten financial conditions. We're about to head into the earnings period at the end of September. So we'll watch with interest as to how things go. My sense is the market is starting to look beyond this wave of Delta uh, and may look to strengthen coming into the year end. From a credit spread perspective, as I mentioned, credit spreads continue to be benign and volatility continues to be quite subdued. So we'll watch for signs of weakness. And if we see some weakness in our breadth models, we'll certainly get defended. But in the meantime, it's just a game of patience and let consolidations take place and get through sort of September and October. And generally we see a strong finish to the year. With that, Pamela, if you've got any questions, we can certainly answer them.
Thanks so much, Dave. Yes, we do have a couple of questions this afternoon. Um, the first from one of your loyal viewers, Teresa, she wants to know if you are concerned about the Evergrande issue in China. And if you are concerned, do you think that this would lead to a liquidity event in the market? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, interestingly, you know, certainly so Evergrande, for those that don't know, is one of the world's biggest real estate developers. Uh, there is real concern about their credit worthiness. Their bonds really have, have been quite heavily uh, pounded. To start with, we have very little or virtually no exposure to China. Um, as the Chinese have taken a more active stance from a policy perspective, meddling in capital markets and in the economy itself, we've chosen to step away from that risk. And so we really have very little exposure there. But it might surprise some people to see, you know, how China is behaving from a market perspective. Let's see if I can pull up a chart here. So, you know, the Chinese, this is an, an ETF ASHR, which tracks the uh, CSI 300. It's backed off a little bit. Um, really, it's just pulled back to where the market broke out from a multi-year trading range. It's actually on a relative basis over the last few weeks, if you look at the Shanghai index, you know, outperforming the U.S. stock market, surprisingly, if you look at the, the Shanghai index. Um, so at this point, we're not concerned that this could lead to, uh, to sort of a broader uh, uh, credit event globally. You know, the Chinese have lots of liquidity. I'm just trying to see if I can pull up the index. Um, here readily. Um, they have a lot of money that they can put into the system to create liquidity. Um, they have been going through a credit tightening cycle. They've signaled that you might get a reserve ratio cut in the fall, which would put more liquidity into the system. Um, my guess is they would likely step in and, and, and do something before there was some kind of a calamitous event. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question. We've uh, spoken about semi the semiconductor space historically, and certainly barometers portfolios have benefited from our thesis on the space and investments that we've made. What is your favorite semiconductor ETF and or company? We have a, a loyal viewer who's keen to put whatever you you select in his right. portfolio. Well, I, I really like I really like the XSD ETF which is a broad-based ETF, which is equally weighted. If you look at some of them, like the SOX index, it's very heavily dominated by companies like Intel. Uh, and I would prefer to have a broader base exposure. You know, we have exposure to some smaller cap ETFs, or smaller cap stocks like SciTime, which we've talked about, advanced micro devices, um, you know, excellent companies, NVIDIA. I think NVIDIA and advanced micro devices, you know, among the most interesting big cap names. But it's hard to imagine the demand for semiconductors doing anything but growing, given what's happening with, with 5G and the Internet of Things uh, and the pervasiveness of artificial intelligence. So I think that this is a sector really, if you're a thematic investor trying to buy leadership in the market, you know, semiconductors are leadership. If you believe that the, the, world, the world is going to start to move beyond, you know, the initial most difficult stages of COVID and there's going to be recovery, then there's going to be, you know, recovery and demand. It's going to take a long time to satisfy even the pent up orders that are in the system. Uh, and so pricing is likely to remain quite strong for the semi producers. Even the, 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 the capital equipment companies, uh, like KLA Tencor, uh, which make equipment, or Taiwan Semiconductor that make equipment, you know, I think are good ways to participate. The risk in Taiwan Semiconductor, of course, is if the Chinese were to do something, um, something overly aggressive in Taiwan, that that might be difficult for them. 
Thanks so much, Dave. You have a beautiful Canadian flag behind you in your office, and that uh, leads me to the next question about the upcoming Canadian election, and if you think that this election would have any um, effect in the market whatsoever, I guess more specifically the Canadian market. I'll let you speak to that one. You know, there are some parts of our Canadian market that are more domestically focused. You know, the banks obviously are more domestically focused, although depending on which bank we're talking about, they have lots of external exposure as well. You know, there has been discussion about, you know, some kind of a profits tax on the banks to recoup uh, spending from the pandemic. I think that's an unlikely outcome. Uh, in general, our basic materials sector is going to be more driven by global demand than, than Canadian demand. Uh, and, you know, we don't have a large consumer Canadian focused sector in Canada. So I think it will have less impact on the Canadian stock market than one might think. It might have a little bit more impact on the dollar. But again, the dollar is mostly driven by uh, energy prices and, and commodity prices. So um, I, I wouldn't get overly concerned from a market perspective about an outcome. I think we're most likely to get a minority government and a minority government in some ways is healthy for the market because it makes, very diff makes it very difficult for large sweeping changes. And the market doesn't like uncertainty. Thanks so much, Dave. The last question coming from David out in Victoria, BC. He's asking uh, for you to explain the difference between fiscal and monetary policy. We often hear those terms used. So the fiscal and monetary policy, what's the difference from the U.S. Federal Reserve? Sure. So, so keep in mind that monetary policy is set by the central bank. And they are managing liquidity in the system. So that's interest rate policy, for instance. Uh, the Fed in over the last number of years has also, you know, been involved in their bond buying program also aimed at creating liquidity in the system. So it's, it's aimed at creating easy financial conditions or tightening them up if inflation were getting out of hand or if the economy were overheating. Fiscal policy is something that's set by the government. And it's, there's been a lack of fiscal policy over the last few years in many countries because uh, governments weren't willing to take action and go out on a political limb to create government programs. So fiscal, an example of fiscal policy might be an infrastructure bill in the U.S. So if the, you, know, you hear talk about $3 trillion being spent on infrastructure, which would be both physical and, and, uh, and HR uh, infrastructure, <clears throat> that's driven by government. Monetary policy is driven by the central bank. Well, thanks so much, Dave. That concludes the questions that we've received this afternoon. And of course, we always appreciate um, your, your, the viewership. And uh, we will be back here next Tuesday afternoon. So don't be shy. Send me your emails, your questions via email or um, via Zoom. And uh, Dave, I'll leave you with the final word. Well, I'll leave it with this. I'm not a huge believer in seasonality, but you have to have to recognize that it does happen sometimes. One of the common uh, sayings is, if you're concerned about the market in the fall, sell Rosh Hashanah and buy Yom Kippur. So I believe that Yom Kippur is on Thursday. Uh, and uh, so I think so far markets handled this period pretty well. Uh, and uh, breadth is, is healthy. And uh, the market looks to have some pretty good shock absorbers underneath it. Uh, I think this is not the market to fade. And so we look forward to seeing how the fall progresses. Thanks, Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Pam, for hosting again today. It was a pleasure. Bye, everyone.